I found that I really, really liked maths and physics. I liked the logical, problem-solving, analytical mindset required. I decided to make my own wind-powered generator. I want to use my love of maths and physics in a creative way to try and solve some of the world's sustainability issues. So I started playing the piano when I was five, and that was through the Suzuki methods. And I'm in the symphony orchestra. We played La Mer last term by Debussy. So this year I'm doing an aesthetics class, which is all about how philosophical movements and the social climate at the time has influenced the music we hear. I've been a member of the National Youth Orchestra for the past three years. And definitely the highlight concert would be the concert at the Royal Albert Hall. I gained a radio amateur license. Through that, I got to learn about how we can communicate through radio. So, so the furthest away that I've ever been able to make contact with was someone from the Falkland Islands. There are days where I wish there were more than 24 hours and there are days where I'm just like, oh, I'm so tired. Welcome to the Diary of a Future CEO and today's guest is Smera Sachin. She's someone with a big adventure ahead as she's just accepted a place to start at Harvard. Smera, welcome. First of all, Harvard, big congratulations. Tell me a bit about the journey to getting there. I think the journey to Harvard was probably a little bit different to everyone else's journey in the sense that I didn't actually think that I was going to be applying to the US until quite late into the process. So I heard from some of my friends that were thinking of applying to the US about the liberal arts programme and the ability to not just study one subject, but also explore other areas alongside that. So after hearing about that, I did a little bit of research. I went online and searched up what, it was, what the whole process is like of applying to the US and what you need to do to you know, start your application and what tests you need to do and all of that. And I just decided to apply to the US as something that I think would be really cool to do and interesting to do and just try it out as an experience. And you succeeded and you're very soon off to Harvard to study the liberal arts approach. So how is that different from the kind of course you might have studied in the UK? In the UK, I was going to study engineering. Um, I got an offer to study engineering at Cambridge at Jesus with a choral scholarship. So that was definitely the route that I wanted to go down. But being able to go to the US, I don't just have to study engineering. I can explore different areas alongside that as well as having my main major in engineering. So what advice would you give someone who is also looking to follow that similar path, maybe go out to the US to study? Just give it a go because it wasn't something that I thought would happen to me or that I would be able to go to the US. So just giving it a go and trying different things out and taking up all the opportunities that you can get is what I'd say. Now your background is very much focused on engineering, on the STEM subjects, the science, engineering, maths for example. Tell us a little bit about your interest and passion in those subjects and where that all came from. So I think it all started with watching David Attenborough documentaries and seeing the, the brightly coloured birds, the penguins, the polar bears and I'd always beg my parents to let me watch a little bit more. And there was this one episode on glaciers and I remember this huge iceberg falling off and Sir David Attenborough saying that these sort of events were becoming more and more frequent and it was due to the warming planet. And there was something inside of me that just thought, I want to do something about this when I'm older. So when I joined the purse and we started exploring the different subjects, I found that I really, really liked maths and physics. I liked the logical, problem-solving, analytical mindset required. And later on, I started doing like different projects and one of the projects I did was because there was a topic in physics electromagnetism that I didn't really like and so as a way to make it more interesting for myself I decided to make my own wind powered generator and I made like a cardboard prototype first and then I made uh, another model of that with 3d printed wind turbine blades I had a laser cut frame I used different magnets, different wires, and I kept on developing this project. And I really liked the sort of iterative design, the way that you can keep on improving what you already have. And so that's when I realised that I want to do engineering. I want to use my love of maths and physics in a creative way to try and solve 
some of the world's sustainability issues and help move our world into a more sustainable future. So how old were you when you put this wind turbine together? Uh, I think I was 15. Yeah, so it was year 10 or year 11. That's really inspiring because there's not a lot of 15 year olds that will actually be thinking, well, let me try and solve that problem now and make a prototype that might work on a larger scale. Yeah, I think that was something that I really wanted to do just because it's it's interesting to try and learn more about things, especially during GCSEs when things are quite memorise this, memorise that. Actually trying out those, using those concepts like the electromagnetic induction effect and using that to try and make your own projects was something that I really wanted to do. And sometimes it's so much easier to learn, isn't it, when you're actually making it rather than just reading it on the page. You can see it working and so it fix into your brain better. Mm -hmm, definitely. And you were awarded an Arkwright Scholarship. Tell us about that. So the Arkwright Scholarship is an engineering scholarship for aspiring engineers. And through that we get mentoring, monetary support for all the different projects that we want to do, as well as the opportunity to see what sort of engineering careers are out there. And one thing that I got to do with Arkwright was visit the Royal Air Force Base in Cranwell and spend a week there and see what life as an army engineer is. And that's something that I definitely would never have been able to do without Arkwright. Getting to see and experience life as an army engineer was really cool to see. Was that perhaps encouraging you to think about a career of service in that field one day or not? After experiencing it, I realised that maybe this isn't the route for me, but it was a really nice way of seeing what sort of career that would you know that that would offer me and learn more about things that maybe necessarily wouldn't spring to my mind first. And the lovely thing about the liberal arts approach that you're taking at Harvard is that you'll have the opportunity to explore different subjects in different ways that you may not have already done. Being able to do subjects that you know I really wanted to do at A level but just because of the timetable and scheduling wouldn't work. So like computer science, economics, geography, those are some of the subjects that I really wanted to do. So being able to go to university and then do that alongside engineering is really appeals to me. So as well as all of your engineering successes, you're also a very accomplished musician. Tell me a bit more about your journey in that field. So I started playing the piano when I was five and that was through the Suzuki method. So there was a huge emphasis on learning by ear and playing with other people. And when I got older, the time came to choose a second instrument. So I remember being in holiday orchestra and watching the older musicians play in the orchestra. And I saw the bassoon in the back and I thought that looks like a really fascinating instrument and I loved the way it looked. So I asked my mum afterwards if I could have lessons and she was like, OK. And since then, I've been playing the bassoon. So I was 10 and I just I just love playing music. It's a really nice way of relaxing and using a different part of your brain. And then as music started becoming more serious, I auditioned for the Royal College of Music. And so I've been attending the junior department since the start of secondary school. And this essentially means that every single Saturday during term time, I travel down to London to have my bassoon and piano lessons. I'm in a chamber group. So I'm in a wind quintet and just last weekend we played the Mio wind quintet in a competition. And I'm in the symphony orchestra. We played La Mer last term by Debussy. I love French music, so that was a real treat. Um, I'm also, I also have my musicianship lessons. So when you're younger, that's more theory based. So Bach chorales, figured bass, dictation. But when you get older, you get to choose the different musicianship classes you take. So this year I'm doing an aesthetics class which is all about how philosophical movements and the social climate at the time has influenced the music we hear. And that's something that I haven't really done or I don't really know much about. So learning about the different literary movements, how different books and works have influenced the way we experience and why the music we hear is the way it is, has been really interesting to me. So as well as playing with the Royal College of Music and learning and progressing there, you also auditioned for the National Youth Orchestra and you've been very successful, haven't you? I've been a member of the National Youth Orchestra for the past three years as part of the bassoon section. 
So the National Youth Orchestra is a community of incredibly talented and hardworking musicians. And we come from all across the United Kingdom. And every holiday we meet to do residencies. So we work with amazing tutors and conductors um, along across the residency on a program, which we then take on a concert tour at the end. I've genuinely learned so much from the tutors and the conductors, and my playing has improved immensely since joining. And some of the concert venues that we get to play at are like the Royal Festival Hall, the Barbican, Bridgewater, and definitely the highlight concert would be the concert at the Royal Albert Hall as part of the BBC proms in the summer. My favourite memory from that would be my first ever BBC proms, where we played Strauss for Last Songs, and oh, it's just the most beautiful piece of music. It was written later in Strauss's life, so it's all about death. And the, the last phrase that the singer sings is, is this perhaps death? And oh, I was just holding back the tears when I heard that. I can see the emotion in your <laughs> voice just changes as you recollect that memory. It's such an unfe like unforgettable experience. I'll, I'll never forget it. Why do you think that is? I think just the energy in that room, the, the audience, there were 5,000 people there. And you know, hearing the applause and seeing the standing ovation at the end is just, it's such a magical experience. Magic that hopefully you can take with you to continue as you go off to university. Music will always be a huge part of my life and I'm going to continue it at the high level that I play at at university for sure. And so you should, and it's really interesting that you referred earlier to asking your mum if you could play another instrument and she was supportive of you. How important has it been to you to have that parental support through this journey? Yeah, incredibly important. Without them, none of this would have been possible. Like when I was younger, my parents would take me to my music lessons. They would take me to all the different extracurricular activities that I would want to do. Like I did a lot of hockey when I was younger, so they would always take me to the training sessions, the matches on Saturdays. And they're always so supportive when I say, oh, is this something that I, I can do? Can I try this out? They'll always be the first people to say, yes, go and have a go at it. So yeah, they've been, none of this would be possible without them. Well, it's good to have supportive parents, but also you've shown so much initiative yourself and willpower to, to make it happen because you don't get to that kind of standard being a musician if you don't practice hard, and I imagine you do. Definitely, it's you know doing the practice every day, making sure that happens, keeping up the commitment is incredibly important. And at times it is tough. There's days where I'm like, oh, I don't want to practice, but it's important to you. And I think the, the commitment to it and just doing a little bit every day is the most important. We've talked about your passion for engineering and your wind turbine invention and your music, but you also have a really unusual hobby, which is CB radios. Now we used to have one at home when I was little and I used to find it fascinating, but what got you into it? It was something I did out of curiosity. So I gained a radio amateur license. My call sign is M7WBU, if you hear me on the radio waves. and. Um, through that I got to learn about how we can communicate through radios, so the different type of antennas we can use, dipoles, yagis, the different ways of transmitting these signals through frequency modulation or amplitude modulation, and the types of signal used to communicate with people across the country or even globally. So the furthest the way that I've ever been able to make contact with was someone from the Falkland Islands over 8,000 miles away they're using HF signals and the ionosphere. And you might say, oh, there, there is the radio, oh, there, there is a mobile phone, why don't you just use that? But there's just something different about using a radio to make contact with someone across the planet. It's really impressive that you were using the long waves to reach somebody that far, because I know when I was little, I'd only ever use the short wave. I didn't even realise you could use the ionosphere to actually make the long radio waves to connect with people, so that's... Wow, you've even taught me something, thank you. <laughs> and do you think that you'll take that further? Is it just a bit of fun or do you think you'll carry on with that? Definitely, it's something that I really enjoy and hopefully when I go to the United States, I'll try and find a radio club near me and join them. I thought it'd be fun to have a bit of a quick fire round. So um, who's your favourite composer? Ravel, I love French music and the way he uses the orchestra, the different colours he produces. There's always something new to listen to each time you hear him.
What's one thing you'll be taking to Harvard with you that isn't study related? Cadbury chocolate bars. Oh, yes. They sell them over there. <laughs> I'll probably stock up on that. And what's um, maybe an engineer or somebody who's invented something that's really inspired you? Not necessarily engineer, but a mathematician who's inspired me is Katherine Johnson. So she was one of the female mathematicians working at NASA, working on the different projectile trajectories of some of the first spacecraft that went into space and into orbit. And as a woman during the 1960s, being one of the leading, leading mathematicians on those, on those projects is so inspiring because the barriers that she must have had to break down to get to where she is, is just incredible. You're a very accomplished young woman, um, successful in so many areas. Are there tough days though? Because some people might be watching or listening and just thinking, wow, Samara has everything together. She's so accomplished, she's so successful. Um, but what, is there the reality of just life when it's not always that easy and everything doesn't always go to plan? Definitely. There are days where I wish there were more than 24 hours and there are days where I'm just like, oh, I'm so tired. But I think it's important to push through those and remember why you're doing things. For well, You're working towards a goal and working towards that goal is what like, really pushes me to work. So there are, there are lows, but there's also highs as well. And I guess it's having the, having the strategies to be able to cope on those days when you're, you've got lots of work or lots of study or a vision or practice to do. What, 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 what gets you through that? What's the secret? <laughs> I think the main thing is prioritising tasks because there's a point where you have to accept you're not going to be able to do everything. And it's important to do the things that you can do to do 100% best of your capability. Um, so a way that I do that is I plan my time just using an Excel spreadsheet, you know, three, four months in advance. And I have my day broken down into half an hour slots and putting in the things that I need to do in the day just sort of takes that mental load off me because I can go home and know that I need to do X, Y, Z as soon as I get home and when I need to do that. So just planning your time and having an effective schedule is one way that I get around that. I definitely need to do that. <laughs> um, finally, we always ask our guests, what would you write in your diary today for your future self to read in maybe 10 years time? I would say do things that you enjoy and do things because you genuinely want to do them. If you want to get better at something or you want to achieve a goal, you're going to have to put a lot of hard work into doing that. And if you enjoy what you're doing, that hard work will come a lot more naturally and it won't feel as hard. So just have fun and enjoy yourself. Thank you so much. I really wish you all the best. Come back and tell us how you're getting on in a, in a couple of years time. Thank we'll you. Do. Thank you so much for having me.